Mario Testino is here. He is a photographer, models, Hollywood stars, and royalty. His work for the last 30 years has covered everyone from Kate Moss to Margaret Thatcher. His exhibitions have drawn record-breaking crowds. Now the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston is unveiling his first solo show in the United States. It is called In Your Face. It is a fitting title for a bold and exuberant collection of images. I am pleased to have him here at this table for the first time. Welcome. Thank you so much, Charles. So you were born in Lima, Peru. Did you, you were going to study international relations well, and things like that? No, I actually didn't know what to study. So the first, um, the first university I went to was uni uh, Economy University. Yeah. I did it for a year. Then I did two years of law. Basically, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And it seemed the right thing that my parents had said, as long as you study, we'll pay for everything. So I did these universities for three years. And then I had a stint at San Diego, California, right. which is a place that I really adore, but I guess I was looking more for a New York energy, and it didn't have it. So I then went to London, 1976, to study communications. I went to California to do international yeah. relations, then I went to London. You know, it was yeah, really right, just right. any excuse to, to be able to, to be kept by my parents, in a way. And um, in London, I fell into photography. How did you fall into it? It's a really funny story. I believe so much that things come to you. And um, basically, I went to a friend's house for lunch, and there was a photograph of himself on his uh, mantelpiece. And I said, what a great photograph. And he told me, oh, this Peruvian girl who studying photography here took it. And I said, I've always heard of this girl. I'd love to meet her. So I went to meet her at her school. When I arrived to the school, she said to me, what are you doing? And I said, well, I've applied to the university, and they've accepted me for next year. But I need really to get a school if I want to stay because I need a student's visa. And she said, oh, why don't you join the school? There's an Iranian girl just left that school. We're only six students. And if you can mm -hmm. afford it, they'll probably accept you. So I applied. I got in. Uh, three months later, the teacher died. He, it was only mm -hmm. him, really, the real teacher. And like two days later, I met this guy who, to who asked me my story again. And I, when I said that I've been at this school, he said, oh, I know the Iranian girl that left your school. She's just opened a studio. Would you like to meet her? So I went to meet her. Yeah. She offered me a job as an assistant. You know, the situation in Peru was really tough at the time. My parents said, you have to come back. There's no more money. We had read like 2,000% inflation with a parallel devaluation. Right. And I decided I want to stay. So I worked as a waiter in a restaurant for another three or four months. And after that, I realized, well, I'm a really bad waiter because I could only pick up one plate and look where it was clean <laughs> yes. and leave every other plate. And the people at the table were like, you're supposed to carry more than one plate. So I decided, I guess I better be a photographer. And, you know, it, it wasn't overnight. It was certainly a struggle to get work. I had to go and show my book in the rain in London and be, um, you know, people would say to me, really, you'll never make it, or you just have no talent, or people were quite blunt. Right. But here I am. Uh, what was the big break? There were different breaks. I guess my first big break was that somebody, right when I started, there was a, an editor in a magazine called Over 21, that doesn't exist right. anymore, the magazine, and the lady in case turned to be a social worker, but she gave me my first break. She thought that I could really produce a cover and a story from beginning to end. And for somebody my age at the time, it was a big break. I mean, it wasn't a big break in the sense that she didn't make me. And maybe my big break came later when Madonna asked Versace to allow me right. to photograph her for the couture. And, you know, uh, when the pictures came out, Versace said, Gianni Versace, who at the time was still alive, said, my God, you really understood these clothes. And... And when he presented the campaign, he wrote, Versace presents Madonna by Testino. And at the time, uh. you weren't called by your surname if you weren't Avedon, Penn, or Newton. And, you know, then things started rolling. Then uh, Princess Diana asked me to photograph her dresses. That was my second big break. Then I got, um, you know, for the sale of the promotion of the sale of her clothes at Christie's. Then Tom Ford asked me to do his campaign for Gucci when he was there right. for 10 years. I worked with him. And maybe that was what really put me in the, yeah. in the world of fashion as a, a photographer. There have been, been times in this really illustrious career in which you worried that maybe it was not 
going to work the way you thought it was when you, you know, know a magazine I, might have stopped calling or something like I that? I think that there is that fear all the time. You know, I, I don't really know. I'm a, fr a freelance, so yeah. even though last year I turned 30 in my profession, I think that there is no assurance. Yesterday I was saying if you win a gold medal at the Olympics, doesn't mean you're going to win it next year. Yeah. And, you know, it's the same with us. I think we're only as good as our last job. And as much as people can tell you, oh, you've really made it, in my head, I don't think you ever really make anything because, mm. I mean, it's like you, you have an amazing reputation, but who knows whether next year, <laughs> you know. Right. That's right. Don't, we hope don't, not. Don't, but don't <laughs> remind me. No, 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 that's true. But it's the truth. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 but also you want to push yourself to be better out of the sheer intrinsic value and the psychic income, as well as the competitive reasons, to be as good as you can. And, and to be better than you were yesterday and not as good as you are tomorrow. And I find that quite difficult when you really know what's good because yeah. you can't cease to compare yourself. I mean, I've been collecting fine art for the last 18 years and I see the freedom that some artists have in their work. And I don't always have that freedom. So I obviously would like to have that absolute freedom. And, you know, when you know something's good, you know that not everything you do is that good. Right. So. It's a constant search, and I don't think that you ever get to be, I don't know, I think the moment you stop thinking that you'll be better, it's the beginning of the end. I no? agree. Uh, you did a famous exhibition in London. Uh, it was the Natural Portrait Gallery? Yeah, right? the National Portrait Gallery in 2002. It's second most successful, only second to Lucian Freud. Well, it was first. It was last first? Year. <laughs> More well, than he, Lucian Freud. He just, no, 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 he's just uh, oh, right, happened. right, right, right. And rightly so, because it was an amazing show he did. I was pretty lucky for a photography exhibition. Yeah. What was it? I mean, were you surprised? What do you think um, made it what it was? You know, it's a mixture of things. I think that, um, like most things in my life, I was lucky with the timing. Yeah. I think that the content of the show was uh, a lot to do with celebrities, and everybody knew every single person that was in this show. It went yeah. from Kate Moss to Princess Diana to Madonna to Gwyneth Paltrow, to, you know, right. and and that really was one of the reasons. The other reason is that the director at the National Portrait Gallery at the time, Charles Sommer Smith, who today is at the Royal Academy, was very kind to give me the freedom to do the exhibition how I wanted to do it. And like I said before, I collect fine art and I have a way of hanging in my house that is very salon style. But in bright colors, I'm, you know, I come from Peru, so right. e even though I think that the English have a real sense for color, too, in their interiors. And he agreed, because at first, when I was approached to the show, I was told that probably they wanted me to do a show with small photographs around the room in a, in a line, in a white room. And I said, well, you know, that doesn't make any sense with my work, because I work for magazines. And when you look at a magazine, your eye is concentrated on the space. And when you put it on the wall, you almost need that same concentration for the image to have the same impact. But you once said to, I feel like a doctor. We've got some interesting quotes here from you. I feel like a doctor who goes to the operating theater with 30 years of experience. Now I feel that I can use all the instruments of the past to get the most interesting photographs. What are the instruments that you use to get the best photographs? Well, you know, light is the main one because photography means writing with light. So right. I would say that that's Photography the main means one. writing with light. Light, yeah. That's probably the, um, the first instrument that I use. But then I do, uh, I deal in aesthetics. So hair, makeup, styling are very, very important. And Contrary to most fashion photographers, I, I, don't, I don't really know, this is what I hear, that um, I pay a lot of attention to hair, makeup, and clothes. And pay attention just, in that you have a, I sit you down have a vision to of what it ought to be. Yeah, exactly. And I can't see, say to you that eye has too much makeup on the bottom or that hair, that volume, that... Yeah. I don't know, you know, it's, it's just the way that I've been raised, I guess, that has trained me like that. And it seems quite superfluous, but it sort of fills people with joy when they manage to see themselves in that light sometimes. And um, so those are other instruments. Then, of course, you know, an image is always uh, created in a space, and I've developed a sense for decorating. So yeah. the, the set is very important. I mean, you know, it's all little yeah. things like that. And it's true that I remember going with Grace Coddington one to do a job in Brazil, and I said to her, I want to shoot in this location. And she said to me, yeah, but... At what time? And I was like, oh, I don't know, whenever, in the morning, in the afternoon. She was like, well, no. you need to know the exact time. Yeah. 
because the sun will heat it from here, from here, you know. And I have to say, I've learned the tough way because I've been trained by many of the best people. I've been very lucky, you know, like? in this business, like uh, Grace Covington, Tony Goodman, Paul Cavaco, Karen Reutfeld, who's in the chambers, Anna Winter, Graydon Carter, you name them, all the people I work with, you know. These are great editors in part. Yeah, and and we photographers are taken by the hand by the editors who guide us and, and sort of correct us and lead us and, and help us, you know. But what, how do they help you? I mean, what is the role to well, help a photographer? Well, you see, a, a fashion photographer has to produce an image with a, an outfit, a dress, a, a whatever we're trying to, to show or promote or sell, depends who you're working for. And... You know, this image is created by putting the right shoes, the right handbag, the right hair, the right makeup. Mm -hmm. you, I do that with them and with all the team. And then when you're doing the photograph, many times you're so concentrated on how to create this image and you're so worried about the light and the, that you maybe don't see something that is happening from this angle because we don't have a hundred eyes, yeah, you know. So yeah. many times, I mean, Tony Goodman is one of them. I work a lot with her for American Vogue and many times she says to me, look at it from this side. And I have had to, I have to say, I've learned through the years, you've got to be so humble in order to grow because the moment you think, you say, oh, shut up, you know, I'm the photographer. You're not yeah, you're not yeah. taking the advantage of what you're being given, and many times I have to eat my words and just. Mm. Do do you see what is it you see? You see beauty. You see uniqueness. You see. I think it's a mixture of things. I mean, I do see beauty, but I don't think the final result is beauty. I see life. I see a mm. certain life that I would like to almost live that I don't ever get to quite live because it's made out of of like perfection and amazingness yeah. and you know things that you don't really get with money or with anything you just get yeah. with the chance the moment you know and and i thrive in this um aspect of photography that with a thousandth of a second you can capture a moment that doesn't exist before doesn't exist afterwards as a kid i used to take the bus to go to school and my friend sat next to me and i always would look at the window yeah. and i see everything happening in the street and i said to him look 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 yeah. by the time he looked it gone and I find photographies like that. And, you know, I try to create those instants in life that make people live a dream or, I don't know, like, um, I don't know. You know, sometimes I look at TV and, and there's so many negative things. I read the paper every day. You see so many negative things happening. Yeah. So I try to create a little bit of the balance for that, you know, yeah. something that makes you think, wow, there is a... A possibility. How often do you see it and snap and you find out you didn't get it? You saw it in your mind's eye, but you don't have it. Well, it's funny because I am a, a, a positive person. Yes. You know, I, I'm, I see everything in from the sunny side. You know, in life, people see the wine so, glass half full or yeah. half empty. You know, I you, see it always half almost full. full. Yeah. And so for me, that doesn't exist because you've got to take life for what it gives you, you know, and, and if you didn't get that, you'll get this other one, and this one is better. It's oh, I see. In other words, no, so you never yeah. say, I missed that. I, I had it in my eye, but I didn't see it, and, no, you know, you no, know there'll be another moment and another, another moment, moment and yeah, another exactly, moment. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think like that. And who's necessarily prepared to say one moment is better than well, another moment? Well, unfortunately, I think that we are we only base our lives on what we know, and what is magical is not necessarily what we know, but we're, we're going to find out, and every mm -hmm. single day I'm having to learn this, you know, people get frustrated because they want the sun and it's raining. I went to Scotland once, and it was pouring with rain for three days. It's a very odd thing for me. It happens in Scotland. Yeah, you know, for me, it's very odd. I'm always sun, 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 wherever I go. Yeah. I sometimes feel weird that the sun follows me. I've realized with time that I've tapped into my telepathy that tells me, go there, and the sun is there. But anyhow, yeah. I went to Scotland, and it rained for three days. So I hadn't brought any lights because my luck is always with me. So... The second, the first day I worked all day long in the rain, I had to borrow a motorbike's outfit from somebody because, of course, I didn't even have the clothes. And, you know, the model was saying that right, right. she could see the water dripping from me. And I, I had no light, so I decided, look, I want to be inside. So I went and bought 200 candles and produced some of the most beautiful photos, maybe, mm. that I could have even... I didn't even know that I would do that, you know? So mm. just have to go with it. Well, something else you said was you said, I tried to emulate the English because I was so impressed by their work and their style, but it was not really me. It's tough to be somebody else, you know. Um, people are always asking me, what would you suggest a, a young photographer to do? And I always say, find who you are, because 
we try to be like so many people. I remember when I started being a photographer, I wanted to take photos like Richard Avedon or Cecil Beaton, or, but I wasn't them, you know, so how could I take them? And I'm very bad at copying. Some people manage to reproduce other people's work and they do it beautifully, sometimes even better than the one before. I don't, yeah. But for me, I'm not good at that, so. You'd also said, I think this was to a former editor at the French Vogue, uh, before I met uh, Karine uh, Rampel, you said, I didn't realize that I'm not English, I am not French, I am Peruvian. So what does it mean to you to be Peruvian? Well, you know, I grew up in a society where we used to look up a lot at Europeans and Americans, you yeah, know? I mean, right. Americans came with television and Coca-Cola and all that, you know. Yeah. And Europeans came with culture and heritage and history. And Peruvians, we were like third world, or at least this is how we used to see ourselves. And it took me a long time to chair, because I went to England to look for something different, you know? And I didn't really realize that being Peruvian was the most wonderful thing that could have ever happened to me. And how difficult it must be not to be Peruvian, you know? But <laughs> I had to really understand that I couldn't do the English style nor the French style. And I needed a woman like Karine Reutfeld to really point it out at me and say, you know, do your pictures. Don't try and do anybody else's pictures. But the problem was that I didn't think my pictures were that great. <clears throat> and um, like this, I've heard so many advice from different people that have said to me, you know, look at um, what, look at your life. You know, I used to do really boring pictures, I guess, in a way, or not boring, but static. And somebody said to me, you know, you're always um, having a good time at a party. Why is it that you don't project that in your pictures? And all of a sudden, I brought life to my pictures. But the truth is that... What did you do different to bring life to your pictures? Well, I had to scream, shout, perform. Oh, I see. Yeah, you know. right, right, right. But the interesting thing is that in, in our lives, comedy is not considered as good as drama. And if not, it's in film. So in photography, it's the same. If you have a laughing picture of a girl, it's not considered as cool than if you have a girl about to... Sex, sex and evocative. Exactly. Well, that I, is very mean. But in general, if the girl isn't like a bit down or gloomy... It's not considered that cool. I asked you who was the most beautiful woman you'd ever photographed. <laughs> and you well, said to me... Well, Kate Moss is the girl that has touched my, you know, my senses the most. I think she That's is, a be better way to express it. She's touched your senses most. Because it's not only one sense. It's not just the eyes, you know, and the beauty. It's the, the humanity, the, the fun, the style, the... I don't know, she just opens... When you are with her, and, and another one that is similar to Kate is Giselle Bunchen. When you're with yeah. these girls, you just feel that life is more exciting. There's more to see. You're more fortunate. You're, I don't know. Yeah, well, she so. said about you because uh, she said that women want to be photographed by you, whether it's Giselle or Kate or whoever it might be, because we want to look like that all the time. You give them a look that they want to be, right? You've you even discover something about them that they may not even know. I think what I do is I tap into them, you know, because I'm always looking. Maybe it's something that happens in a small part of their lives or in the day, and I look at that, and that's what I try to bring out. All right, uh, we'll look at some images now. All right, let's talk about them. This, the first one we're going to see is Kate Moss. All right, take a look up here. What am I looking at? Why is that an interesting photograph? What does that say about her? What does it say about you? It's very interesting because this is the photograph that has surprised me the most. It's the most successful photograph that I've done probably in the last two years. And it just says something about the intimacy maybe that I might have with the person, you know, because it's, yeah. it's called Kate at mine. It's at my place. And it's, um, you know, like she's getting ready to go... Um, somewhere else you know yeah, often right. at night you have a dinner party and then after the dinner party you would go somewhere else right, and, right. and it's these sort of moments that um that i was trying to create i was trying to kate always says to me i love those photographs that you do that are not fashion photographs the photos that you capture right because I, like this like this you yeah, know and yeah. i we decided to do this story like it wasn't a photograph that was planned but a photograph that just happened and I did a lot of training to be to, to get these images because training. Well, I thought that a photographer, like a photojournalist, has a quickness with his camera that captures moments that you know are right, like right, quick. Sure, sure. And it I is. thought that I had to train myself like a cowboy because cowboys have to draw their guns. Well, at least in films, yeah. You know, they have to draw their guns as quickly as they can in order to survive, right. not to die. 
And photography is a little bit like that because those moments, they, yeah. you know, they're fast. And so I would create my images to perfection and then destroy them to make them look like there was no effort. I love things to be completely effortless. Take a look at the next one. This is Giselle Bunchkin. There you are. I mean, the picture is cropped perfectly because you so, see it all the way down her leg to the shoes. Well, it's funny because... And it's stretched across, so there's a sense of... This is an image done for a cover of a magazine for Vanity Fair for the style issue. Yeah. Uh, I'm really bad with dates, but it's two or three years ago. 2007. Oh, my God. <laughs> Five years Five ago. Years ago. <laughs> How scary. <Yeah. laughs> uh, they say when the things go right and you're having a good time, it goes yeah, quickly. Yeah, you know? that's right. All right. But, so, uh, so this photograph is already done with other restraints around it in the sense that I need to make sure that there's space to write, you know, that the cover needs to have a split space and... So it is perfectly controlled and calculated, whilst the other one had no real uh, need to be in any format or not. She's a beautiful woman, isn't she? She's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what's amazing about her is that everything is perfect. She, last night I opened my show in Boston and she came and she's pregnant of eight months. And right. I mean, even pregnant with a fate month, you would think that maybe she's not as incredible, and she's in more incredible. Well, wow. All right, take a look at the next one. Gwyneth Paltrow. This is 2005. She has left the floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is um, a story that we did for the couture for American Vogue with Tony yeah. Goodman, was my editor. And um, I always see models because they have quite a tough life. These girls are constantly having to go from one city to another. They're young and they're on their own. And often they bring their brothers, their sisters, their best friends, mm. their, you know, somebody mm. from the family. So we had this idea of having her come with her brother who was a skateboarder and how within the environments that she's living because of the situations that you get put through couture is very elegant, you know. So, but there is a brother sort of completely out of place. I, I yeah. quite like that out of placeness. Uh, the next one is Stella Tennant. This, this was is... done for American, but for Grace Co yeah. with Grace Collington for yeah. the. Um, I mean, if I get it right, I think it was the the Sondageris. You like black and white or color? I like color. You do. Yeah. I, mean, I think life is in color. It's very funny. My mom. But look at your clothes. Exactly, because I do it on my pictures, but you should see me how I was before I started doing this. I had a lilac terry cloth suit with platform shoes. But, you know, I was pretty loud. Lilac? Yes. Right. I love lilac. Uh, the next is Hilary Rhoda, Jessica Stam, Nia uh, Cabetti. This I did for French Vogue with Karine Reutfeld. Right. I mean, Karine has this eccentric side to her. She loves something that is sort of off. And it's, these are very, you were asking me about editors, editors what exactly. they do, you know, and what I've noticed is that they all bring different sides of me. You know, I work with the Americans, the English, the French, and they all have different points of view. They like different women and their societies are really different. You know, a woman in France wants to be really elegant. A woman in England doesn't want to yeah, be elegant. Know, she wants just, to be completely... We just had Anouka May here. She's amazing. No, I saw her once at, at the theater in Paris, and the theater was, uh, they turned off the lights, and the only person that you could see was her in the auditorium, because the skin it was, it was, it, is so it was white. unbelievable. She came and did a segment with me, and it was, she was so alive. Uh, yeah, alive, you know, exactly. Alive. <laughs> I mean, people just were, I mean, knocked out. People would stop me on the street and say, how incredible no. she was. Yeah, how incredible she and, was. And I mean, and I don't know how old she is Part of it now. is European. Yeah. She's over 80. Over 80, amazing, no? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's great. I met her 30 years ago. Well, I didn't meet her, but I, I saw her at, a, an, at an event, and I was blown away by her. I knew her from films, because yeah. we trained with French and Italian yeah. films. Uh, the next is a picture of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. There they are, it's the beautiful Kate Middleton. It's a photograph, because I was just looking through my computer for the pictures that we had done for the engagement. They were standing next door, next to me, just to... I was showing yeah. them, and then all of a sudden, I just turned around, and... Hmm. They are such an, an amazing right. couple. Take a look. And then here's an interesting photograph. This is Keith and Mick. Uh, taken. How did you get that photograph? What did you say to them? God, it's interesting. I guess I know them socially. You know, I know their kids and, right. and, and their wives. And, you know, so I, I don't know. I was in L.A. We were in a hotel. I put a, a seamless in a hotel. And I just said, 
I want to get that energy each that other. you guys have. You yeah. said what? I want to. I capture. want to get that energy that you guys have in between yeah. you because all the years you've been together, you know. And there, okay. where do you put this in the pantheon of favorite photographs? They're amazing. It's an amazing picture for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's those. It's a rare picture. Um, you know what's funny is that I go through my life adapting to the moments. You know, yeah. This moment they had, they could give me I think two hours. I flew to LA just to do this photo for two hours, yeah. and they wouldn't go out of the hotel, so I had to put a seamless. And I was sort of younger than now and a little bit, uh, you know, insecure. And and so you try, you do the best you can that moment. Right. But maybe I'd never use this light again. You know, maybe yeah. something yeah. I used then because I thought it suited that that situation. And this happens a lot. What do the best models have? Personality. Really? Yeah. I, to me, anyhow, you know, we're all different. I, there's people that like a model that is a blank canvas. Me, I like a girl, a person that I yeah. can, you know, Anna Winter said to me years ago, and it stayed in my mind, she said, I don't want in the magazine girls that I can't have at a table and can talk to anybody because I need personality. And, and it's so true, you know, I have to spend my day with the girls, so I don't understand how people can spend their days with somebody that won't talk, won't yeah. give you, and you, we go back to the GCLs and the Kates. Now, do I remember that when you were in London and you were trying to get started, did you take a series of photographs of young male models, nude? Yes. When and that was a breakthrough because somebody saw that because they were so thin or something yeah, and said, you're on to a big idea. What happened was that I, when I started in the 80s, I worked with Franca Sozzani, who today is the editor-in-chief of Italian Vogue. She had two magazines she ran, Per Louis and Lay. They were for young boys and girls. And Bruce Weber was a photographer at the time. And when you went to agencies... He's still a photographer, isn't he? Well, no, but at the time he was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, right, the right, revelation. Right. I mean, he has been the relation for many years now, but then it was the beginning. And yeah. all the model agencies had all the models look like a Bruce Weber model. And I needed to find my own model, so I found them in the streets, at the parties, at restaurants. And I photographed them for these magazines for a long time. When she closed the magazine to go to Vogue, I carried on finding the people, but I didn't have the clothes or the time to really style them. So I decided to work on my light. And as in drawing, you the first thing you learn is nudes. Right. I thought that to train my light, I should do nudes as well. And it was an interesting moment because they would come in the morning when we were all preparing for whatever else we were doing in the shoot, and I would do one after the other. And I have a collection of them. I started with the guys, then I went with the girls. I sort of felt yeah. harder to get the girls to do it. But um, with the years, I... Sort of is, is any of that in this exhibit that you'd... Uh, only to, only one, one boy and one girl. Yeah. Okay, Mario Testino, In Your Face, put on by Boston's Museum of Fine Art, a very fine museum. First U.S. exhibition of your work. It run from October 21st, 2012 to February 3rd, 2013. Uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.